Video one, Orientalism. Hello, everyone. For those who don't know me, I am Dr. Emma Yasui from Asians Represent, and I am here to tell you that words are hard. Here at Asians Rep, we use a lot of words and ideas when examining Asian representation in the wide world of pop culture and media. So in these videos, I'll do my best to give a focused rundown on some of those terms and concepts that we find particularly useful in what we do. Definitions can be complicated because they come with hidden meanings and histories, and they also change over time. But what we can start with is some background. But before we get into the details, what do you think of when I say Orientalism? This is a great place to start with any word uh, by looking at your own perceptions. If you've never really thought about this word in particular, try instead to think about what the word orient or oriental brings to mind. It's very likely that certain images or other words are popping up, and you may not be sure why these terms and associations are seen as negative or why people take issue with being referred to as oriental. For some, the terms orient and occident are simply geographic designations that are partly determined by cultural similarities. This understanding sees the East-West divide of Orient and Occident as just an objective fact. Therefore, Oriental studies and Orientalist research are just about the peoples and places of a region. Well, sorry to say that in this world, pretty much nothing is objective and simple. So this is particularly true when people get involved. A good way to start interrogating this framework is to ask, why is this the East? And this will lead you into more questions like, how did it become the East? And where do these shared concepts come from? Which brings us into the realm of Orientalism and the work of Edward Said. Well, Said is not the first to outline Orientalism and its components or critique the practices within Orientalist studies, he was quite different at the time as a Palestinian American who had experienced both British and American systems as a non-white, non-European scholar. Edward Wadi Said was born in Jerusalem in 1935 and was raised in the British school systems within Palestine and Egypt before moving to America and pursuing higher education in English literature. Despite being an excellent scholar, Saeed noted that he had this inescapable feeling of being an Arab in Western institutions, always outside and always the other compared to his contemporaries. He was a rare case of a diasporic, high-level scholar who wrote about Orientalism as someone who was directly affected by its history and ongoing influence. He wrote using the tools and language of Western academics to establish his place in the conversation, but also directed his works at a wider audience by publishing through non-academic companies, which made his books easier to find as well as afford. His best known work that follows this example is Orientalism, which was published in 1978. And this book has greatly influenced how we use the word today. Orientalism generally refers to the studies and depictions of the Orient or Eastern world. But more specifically, Orientalism is used critically and in a negative sense. It refers to the collection of myths and misconceptions applied to the East by Western societies. Inspired by his lived experience and the work of other scholars like Anwar Abdel Malek, Saeed not only outlined the features of Orientalist research and popular culture through time, he pushed the overarching argument that Orientalism and colonialism are inseparable. So the too long didn't read of why Orientalism is bad is that colonialism is bad. So terms like Orient and Oriental are also going to be bad. But Let's break down the specifics here. There are three major points to consider from Said's book. The first is that the Orient does not exist. It is not an objective geographic region or a set of cultures. 
And what is considered Oriental depends on someone's place in time and space. For many in Europe, for a very long time, the Orient has referred to Southwest Asia and North Africa, especially Muslim and Jewish peoples within this region. After a while, it expanded to include South Asia. Meanwhile, in North America, the Orient is more likely referring to East and Southeast Asia, and Said's book concerns itself primarily with Muslim and Arabic Orient, but there are common threads that bind these expressions of Orientalism. In each case, the Orient is a fabrication, an imagined opposite of the West. Many artists, scholars, and politicians use the shared concept of the Orient to highlight what they saw as the superior essence of the West. The Orient is then understood through broad comparison and not through the nuances of its peoples, cultures, histories, or societies. So to answer the question, why is it the Orient in the first place? Well, it's the East because the dominant viewpoint was coming from the European seat of Western power, which connects directly with the second point, that Orientalism is what is known as a technology of power, and it has never been objective in any way. The act of defining the Orient and controlling the discussion gave the West a power over it, which means the observations and arguments presented by Western scholars were not separate from politics or public perceptions. The dominant vision of the East was thus created through a mix of artistic representation, academic publication, and government policies that all fed each other. This created vision of the East was far more powerful than reality and often hinted at a distrust or distaste for the East. A common theme was how the East had lost itself. It was once great but fallen or had stopped progressing due to inherent abilities to organize, cooperate, or be rational. It was then up to outsiders to document the Orient's history as a way to understand the essentials that could help these people understand their own past and improve their present. This is very clearly a savior perspective, which is common in colonial policies. And intentional or not, the scholarship and art that perpetuated this perspective contributed to a Western sense of moral authority, as well as the feeling that they had the right to govern the region. It justified Western domination and encouraged everyone to see the East as an abstract category rather than a population of individuals able to represent themselves. And now the final point is that Orientalism did not end when colonialism and imperialism declined. Although it is deeply integrated into the colonial system, the ideas within Orientalism continue to influence how the greater East is seen. Centuries of art, literature, and national narratives mean that certain notions and beliefs are just deeply ingrained around the world today, including informally colonized peoples who have internalized elements of Orientalism after generations of Western influence. Now, Said's major arguments are good to think with, but it's in the finer details that we can really you know, help the average person to identify when harmful concepts of Asia, North Africa, and its diaspora communities are being used in media that we consume. Some of the hallmarks of Orientalism have been covered in other Asians represent videos, so you may already be familiar, but here we go. In games and other media, watch for descriptions or elements that present real or fantasy Asia and its peoples as alien, strange, or other. These depictions tend to assume a Western ideal, which then means the East is odd and foreign at its core. It also presents the East as mysterious and typically cannot be understood except by a few dedicated outsiders. Next are descriptions that suggest the East is stagnant, uncreative, or degenerate, the societies are portrayed as either stunted or degraded in a social evolution framework, and this usually means they must be helped by more advanced societies and outside peoples. 
Okay. A major characterization of the East has also been that it is sensual and exotic. The East is seen as a place for fantasies, self-discovery, and exploring desires. And as most Orientalist scholars and artists in the past were male, the emphasis has often been on women and the idea that they exist for male pleasure. So, gross. The East is also commonly depicted as uncivilized, cruel, or despotic because its peoples are unable to or unwilling to embrace Western-style government, religion, and institutions. They are somehow irrational or inhumane. They can also be dangerous as well as deceptive. There's this real idea of them living by a different code of morals, and this comes out in a lot of character descriptions and world settings. And finally, watch for portrayals that remove diversity to make Eastern peoples indistinguishable and also make them into silent objects or objectify. In these depictions, we see large populations that are likely diverse being reduced to essential elements and trends. They lose individuality and tend to be presented without their own voices. So, there it is, a brief explanation of a complicated topic, and certainly not an exhaustive overview. But hopefully now you feel like you have the basics for when we talk about Orientalism. Check the description below for some resources, and let us know if there are any terms or concepts that we have used that you would like to hear more about. And thank you for watching.